it has come to my attention over the years that our schools are not teaching the Declaration of Independence. And uh, for many of you, it has been quite a long time since you've actually read uh, or had read to you the Declaration of Independence. I believe it's something that every family uh, should do on an annual basis, or at least individuals within a family should do to read. And uh, as God has instituted three, um, uh, three areas of life, he's instituted the institution of the family, uh, and of course, um, that is a gift from God to us, the family, and the church has been instituted by God, in addition, civil government has been. In, these are the three major institutions that God has brought, and so many people like to uh, like to ignore the civil government. Talking about civil government and church, because they've been cowed into submission over the past fifty or sixty years. That well, you know, don't you know there's a separation of church and state, that's in the Constitution. Not, by the way, it's not. Uh, and so I think that it's essential for us to speak regarding the institution of civil government that God has given us. Uh, there is a particular passage that is important that will just introduce the subject, and that's Romans 13.1. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except by God's appointment, and the authorities that exist have been instituted by God. Now, that is not to say, that most people, when they read this, they misunderstand what this is saying, saying that, hey, whatever leader you have, he's been instituted by God. He has been, in, so therefore, if he's a lousy leader, suck it up, that's God's gift to you. Not, not how the passage actually reads. It's a distortion of the passage, right? Because if that were the case, if, if uh, every lousy leader that came along over the decades uh, we were stuck with because uh, God has uh, given it to us, uh, then no one would ever be justified, for example, in trying to remove Hitler from office, right? And yet I stand with uh, uh, Bonhoeffer in his aborted coup, uh, against uh, and trying to assassinate Hitler and take him out, or Stalin, or whatever. Okay, so point being that if you look at, let's say, our current president and say Biden, okay, I'm not crazy about him, but he's uh, instituted by God, and so I'm stuck with him. Don't blame God for Biden. Okay, God is responsible for government. Okay, uh, and you may have a different, you may have a monarchy, you may have a republic, like we have, not a democracy, you may have a democracy, you may have a, a monarchy, whatever you may have, you may have various different kinds of, of uh, governments. Those have been, the idea of government has been established, instituted by God. But the particular guy that you have at any given time, don't lay that on God, okay? Which is how you can come 250 years ago, and say, well, okay, I don't like the way government is going right now, um, and so I can rebel against government. The only reason that you can rebel against not government per se, but by a, of a particular leader, is if that particular leader and that particular government is no longer doing what government is designed to do, by God designed to do which in that passage, the Romans passage 13, uh, punish the unjust or, you know, punish the wicked and reward the righteous. Those are the two jobs, okay? So sorry to inform, uh, inform all of those who love our politics, whatever, but the government has actually only two jobs. That is to punish the guilty, and reward the good. And if it's not doing that, in fact, if it's doing the opposite, then you have tyranny, not government. Despotism, not government. And so that is why Thomas Jefferson was tasked with the role of writing a declaration 
of grievances, a declaration that would express to the world and to the states and to Great Britain, to England, just why the states felt aggrieved, so aggrieved that they wanted to throw off despotism and tyranny as opposed to maintaining the status quo. The status quo was no longer acceptable. And so let me read this very quickly. We'll take about 20 minutes and we'll go through this. In Congress, July 4th, 1776, it was really earlier, July 2nd, the unanimous declaration of the 13 United States of America, by the way, this is the last time that any American Congress was unanimous on their decisions. Uh, uh, but notice that these are United States. This is not a new nation per se. The 13 colonies had not uh, imagined that they would be developing an entirely new nation with central powers. That's what they were rebelling against. That's what they were rejecting under England. And so when we look at the Declaration of the 13 United States of America, we are reminded that the Declaration and the War of Independence was not something that had the goal of a united uh, one block, uniform nation? No, not uniformity, but unity. States, not one single state, states. And they were united. And there were a tremendous amount of diversity within this. If you know your, your Revolutionary War history, you know that there's a tremendous amount of diversity that was uh, exhibited by the various different colonies. The South obviously had their own culture. Um, nobody from Massachusetts wanted anything to do with grits, for example. But nonetheless, in the South, they were stuck with grits. So you had, uh, you had uh, 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 various different cultural issues. Massachusetts was very different from Georgia. Uh, and New York was very different from uh, South Carolina, um, the various different colonies were diverse. But the thing is, unlike what you may have heard, diversity is not our strength. How could it be? I'll start believing that diversity is our strength when the Mavericks invite a chubby Jewish guy and draft a chubby Jewish guy to play on the team and, uh, and, and don't worry about the fact that uh, uh, they're not, uh, that guy can't make baskets and can't compete with the other players. You don't want a diverse team of Mavericks. You don't want a diverse team of Rangers. You don't want a diverse team of cowboys. No chubby Jewish guys on that football field. You want big hulking guys for football, whatever the color may be. Uh, for uh, for uh, basketball, you want really tall guys, okay, of athletic. You want merit, in other words. So um, it is not diversity that is our strength. And while here we have a diverse group of states, they're not saying that it's our diversity, that it's our strength here. The diverse United States of America, or the diverse states of America, they're saying the United States of America, it is unity in diversity that is our strength. E pluribus unum, from many, one. What is the church? if not an example of e pluribus unum, unum, diversity or uniformity in diversity from many, one, Jews, Gentiles, men, women, black, white, Asian, Hispanic, higher socioeconomic, lower social, middle. We're a diverse group of people even within this one congregation. 
And so the United States were indeed quite diverse. But as you see, it was unanimous. They were united. It is not uniformity. It is unity. Our Lord prayed, O Lord, make my disciples unified. Not uniform, but unified. So anyway, United States of America, it is our unity in our diversity that is our strength and was the strength of the 13 colonies. When in the course of human events, in other words, in history, it becomes necessary for one people, diverse though they may be, united in purpose, one people, to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with Another and to assume among the powers of the earth a separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and nature's God entitle them. By the way, I want you to note two of the four references to God in the Declaration of Independence. You wonder why the Declaration of Independence is no longer read in our public schools. I'll tell you why. Because people are afraid that they cannot bring God into the classroom, that someone will accuse them of mingling church and state. There is no constitutional separation between church and state. And in fact, the very presupposition of the Declaration of Independence is that God created us. There is a God. There is a creator. He is called nature's God and therefore there are certain laws because he is consistent. So the presupposition of the Declaration of Independence is that there is indeed a God. So every time someone tells you that you cannot bring God into the public square, you must remind them that our birth certificate brings God into the public square, not once, not twice, but four times. Very clearly, unambiguously, and all they are exhibiting by their bullying and saying you cannot bring God into the schools or onto the football field or into Congress or into our anywhere, they're simply exhibiting their ignorance of their own birth certificate. But if you reject your roots, if you reject your origins, if you want to redefine your origins, well, it's no wonder ignorance abounds. But nonetheless, the laws of nature, nature's God entitled them. A decent respect for the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to the separation. We hold these truths to be Self-evident. Nobody has to explain them. These are our presuppositions. These are clear to anyone who has eyes, ears, and an intelligence. Self-evident truth. That all men are created equal. That they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Again, Genesis 1 and 2, chapters 1 and 2 are the presuppositional facts on which the Declaration makes its case. And note that it does not say anything about equity. It does not say anything about social justice. It does not say anything about making sure that there are equal outcomes. No, God did not ensure, and life tells us, our very eyes and ears show us, that we live in a world without equal outcomes. In fact, we live in a world where certain people are born with certain advantages and certain people are born with certain disadvantages. Some have a, a silver spoon in their mouth when they're born. Some struggle and have hardship. Others are in the middle. Some have physical disabilities. Some have great natural abilities. Some are gifted with natural talents. Some are challenged in that area. It is that all men are created equal. All men and women, of course, mankind, have equal worth. We are all God's 
children. We're all his creation. What we do with the talents, that's a wonderful parable, you know, the parable about Jesus and the, the, the employer who gives talents and say, okay, you're gonna, you're gonna have uh, one talent and you're gonna have three talents. This is financial uh, coinage. And you're going to have 10, right? And he comes back, this is what they did with their talents, right? Doesn't distribute gifts, but they are all of equal worth. Every one of us is created equal. That is American ideology. That is Jeffersonian philosophy expressed here. And that because we are created equal, of equal worth, men, women, wherever we are in the world, they are all, we are all endowed by God, by our Creator, with certain unalienable rights. These are rights that are not endowed by government. They're not given to us by government. Government does not give us these things. If government gives us these rights, then government can take these rights away. But they're unalienable. And among these, in other words, these are the big ones, but this is not an exhaustive list. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But there are more, which he doesn't list here. Certain among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Again, government does not give me life. Government does not give me the right to pursue pursue happiness, and government does not give me liberty. God gives us those rights. They are for all of us. But to secure these rights, government, this is where government comes in. Governments protect those rights. Governments secure those rights. And therefore, governments are instituted by God among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. That whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, when government no longer protects these unalienable God-given rights, when government ceases to do as Scripture says, reward the good, punish the evil, when government becomes tyrannical, when government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or abolish it and to institute new government, laying its foundation on such principles and organizing its power in such form as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. Prudence, indeed, will dictate that governments long established should not be changed for light and transient causes. This is not to be done for whimsical reasons. You don't turn over government uh, just because of a flight of fancy. You must have significant reasons to do so. That's prudent. And accordingly, all experience hath shown that mankind are more disposed to suffer while evils are sufferable than to right themselves by abolishing the forms to which they are accustomed. In other words, we as people have a great propensity to put up with a lot of aggravation before the last straw has broken the camel's back. We are long-suffering as people. I think that the prior five decades of our nation have demonstrated that most abundantly and apparently that we are a patient, long-suffering people who will suffer a lot before we decide to change things over. But, 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 when a long train, how long is that track? A long train of abuses and usurpations, pursuing invariably the same object, evinces a design to reduce them under absolute despotism, tyranny in other words. It is their right, it is their duty to throw off such government and to provide new guards for their future security. Let's do it for the children. Such has been the patient sufferance of these colonies. And such is now the necessity which constrains them to alter their former systems of government. The history 
Oh, the present king of Great Britain is a history of repeated injuries and usurpations, all having in direct object the establishment of an absolute tyranny over these states. To prove this, the facts, let facts be submitted to a candid world. And Jefferson lays out 27 facts, 27 objections, grievances. I'm not going to read all 27. I'm simply going to pick, cherry picking, just a few. Some of the grievances are very time and culture bound, um, historical context, but some of them I think you might find they might be evergreen and you might recognize some of these grievances in a contemporary fashion. Here's number seven, for example. He has endeavored to prevent the population of these states for that purpose obstructing the laws for naturalization of foreigners, refusing to pass others to encourage their migrations hither and raising the conditions of new appropriations of land. So uh, what the king is being accused here is of limiting immigration. Seems ridiculous to our ears, right? Uh, of course, today we have the absolute opposite. We have unfettered, illegal immigration. We have two tiers of immigration, the legal and the illegal. When you have an open border in the South, it's illegal immigration. And it's far surpassing the legal, right? Um, the legal immigrants are being acculturated and they, are, they have to pass a, a pretty comprehensive historical and civic test, right? To understand what does it mean to be an American. That way, when you bring in people from foreign cultures and foreign uh, countries, uh, societies who don't understand the American way, um, if there is such a thing anymore, they can be acculturated. But if those legal immigrants are far outnumbered by illegal immigrants who are simply being let in willy-nilly without any culture, no, no attempt to culture it. In fact, every encouragement to maintain your own culture and thumb your nose to the American way of life, our laws, our mottos, our history, well, then we should not wonder when, as we have now, arguably 10% of our national population fits into that particular category. When one in 10, or let's say one in 12, generously, have not been acculturated to the merit, but are in fact encouraged to maintain their own cultures and ethnicities without any reference to America. It's no wonder that we have such confusion today. But that was opposite of what the colonists were experiencing back then. It was the very opposite. He has erected, number 10, he's erected a multitude of new offices and sent hither swarms of officers to harass our people and eat out their substance. If this is an evergreen, I don't know what is. We have many new offices. New, do you remember... A few administrations ago, there was such a proliferation of appointed czars that was the, it was as ubiquitous to appoint a new czar as any time there is some kind of a, uh, 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 a hubbub to affix the suffix gate to it, right? It was just, so you appointed this person, the czar of this and this and this, the czar. There was multiplications of offices. Along with those czars came a multiplication of staffs and offices and uh, organizations that have two and three uh, letters, acronyms. Our nation has indeed, nothing new here, erected a multitude of new offices. Swarms of officers to harass our people. We just hired 87,000 more for the IRS. That's an office that's not in the Constitution, original Constitution. And eat out their substance, indeed. Get out to buy extra groceries, you know, to account for those government officers eating out your substance. 
Number 13, he has combined with others to subject us to a jurisdiction foreign to our constitution and unacknowledged by our laws, giving this assent to their acts of pretended legislation. That's an evergreen. You read about the World Health Organization and our wanting to, our government wanting to uh, uh, subordinate ourselves to the World Health Organization and follow their lead instead of our own laws. Um, when the WEF comes up with new laws, we have a great number of governmental offices who would love to dance to the tune of the World Economic Forum, Klaus Schwab and his friends at Davos. Call me a nationalist, if you will. But I simply look at this and I say, no, call me a patriot. For imposing taxes on us without our consent, enough said. For depriving us, in many cases, of the benefit of trial by jury. I thought growing up, well, it's one of the great things about America. Everyone receives due process. Justice is blind. And the law is applied to the rich, to the poor. No matter what your ideology, no matter what your political proclivities are, we all receive due process until the events of the past two and a half years have shown me that you can languish in jail without due process, without even perhaps the benefit, in many cases, of having charges formally brought against you. And that once you are brought to trial, it is not, your punishment is not in the hands of a jury of peers, but of a judge wanting to make an example. Well, evergreen. For taking away our charters, abolishing our most valuable laws, and altering fundamentally the forms of government every time our president, no matter who he is, writes 50 executive orders on his first day in office. He's usurping the legislative form to which our founding constitution demands he follows. The legislature makes the legislation. That goes also for the Supreme Court. This week, social media, the news is a flame, is a Twitter, pardon the expression, with people up in arms that the Supreme Court has made several decisions, determinations that actually restore constitutional norms and correct law that was made by the Supreme Court. Stay in it. We all must stay in our lanes. We have checks and balances, three forms of government. We all know that. And what was happening back then is that the king was usurping the laws of the states. Whatever he wanted to do, taxation, whatever he wanted to do, he could fundamentally change them. For surrendering our own, for suspending our own legislatures and declaring themselves invested with power to legislate for us in all cases whatsoever. Grievance number 22. More of the same. He has, 27, has excited domestic insurrections amongst us got the uh, American Indians, Native Americans, riled them up, fomented insurrection in the populace, and has endeavored to bring on the inhabitants of our frontiers the merciless Indian savages. And then, of course, we have the 28th grievance. This one is the 28th. It is a grievance that Thomas Jefferson, while he wrote it, 
it was not accepted into the Declaration by the 13 colonies. Every one of those other grievances, the 13 colonies were unanimously agreed and could accept those declarations, those grievances. Except for the 28th, where with the other 27, you had unanimity and unity. For this 28th, you had three states in the South that simply would not agree and if they could not agree to this one, it either A, needed to be excised from the Declaration, or the Declaration itself would have never passed the 13 colonies. So we don't learn this one in school, but nonetheless, it is history. The 28th grievance. He, King George, has waged cruel war against human nature itself violating its most sacred rights of life and liberty in the persons of a distant people who never offended him, captivating and carrying them into slavery in another hemisphere or to incur miserable death in their transportation thither. This piratical warfare, the opprobrium of infidel powers, is the warfare of the Christian king of Great Britain, determined to keep open a market, a slave market, where men should be bought and sold. He has prostituted his negative for suppressing every legislative attempt to prohibit or restrain this execrable commerce. That is a wonderful adjective. Execrable. It was the desire of great many American colonists, a great many who felt strongly about abolition and worked tirelessly to abolish slavery. But every time the states came forward to try to make a law outlawing slavery in the states, in the colonies, King George said, sorry, suck it up, we're going to maintain slavery in the states and the colonies. So that's something that we don't normally get taught, but nonetheless, there it is. 28th grievance. That this assemblage of horrors might want no fact or distinguished die. He is now exciting these very people to rise in arms among us and to purchase that liberty of which he has deprived them by murdering the people on whom he has obtruded them. So in other words, let's get the slaves now that we have denied freedom to the slaves, let us get them riled up and have them kill the patriots. Thus paying off former crimes committed against, again, the liberties of one people with crimes which he urges them to commit against the lives of another. Final section. In every stage of these oppressions, we have petitioned for redress in the most humble terms. Our repeated petitions have been answered only by repeated injury. A prince whose character is thus marked by every act which may define a tyrant is unfit to be the ruler of a free people. Nor have we been waning in attendance to our British brethren. We have warned them from time to time of attempts by their legislature to extend an unwarrantable jurisdiction over us, taxation without representation. We have reminded them of the circumstances of our emigration. We are British citizens and our settlement here. We've appealed to their native justice and magnanimity. And we have conjured them by the ties of our common kindred to disavow these usurpations which would inevitably interrupt our connections and correspondence. They too have been deaf to the voice of justice and consanguinity. We must therefore acquiesce in the necessity which denounces our separation and hold them as we hold the rest of mankind Enemies in war, in peace. Friends, we therefore, the representatives of the United States of America and General Congress assembled, appealing to the supreme judge of the world for mentions of God in the Declaration, for the rectitude of our intentions do in the name 
and by authority of the good people of these colonies, solemnly publish and declare that these united colonies are, and of right, ought to be free and independent states, that they are absolved from all allegiance to the British crown, and that all political connection between them and the state of Great Britain is and ought to be totally dissolved. And that as free and independent states, they have full power to levy war, conclude peace, contract alliances, establish commerce, and to do all other acts and things which independent states may of right do. And for the support of this, of this declaration, with a firm reliance on the protection, fourth mention, of divine providence, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. What are we celebrating on Tuesday? A proliferation of hot dogs and hamburgers on the grill? Sales on mattresses and appliances? We stand on the shoulders of these brave patriots who pledged their lives, their fortunes, and their sacred honors, who did what they had to do, what they felt they had to do, when conscience demanded that action was taken. It's July 4th. It's an exciting weekend. It's an exciting day.